um, and an email from CIAG, um, and then an email from Michael McKinnon, the Director of Civil Government Affairs. So you have copies of those in a press release, um, all within your packet. I will be speaking to all of the correspondents um, from the State Department of Ed and the CIAC when we go through the superintendent's report. All right. So with that, we're moving on to standing committees, individual reports, superintendent update on the parent survey, and the U.S. communications from the CT Department of Public Health and the State Department of Education. Superintendent Brown. Thank you. First and foremost, I would just like to start before I do my report thanking all the members of the community who came out tonight and the members of the community who have emailed and reached out and the individuals who completed our survey. As Mr. Sugarman will report, we had over 1,200 individuals complete the survey online, over 300 return paper surveys. I'm incredibly excited by that level of community involvement. I want to thank you for coming out tonight and for your commitment to our students and to our schools. For members of the board, uh, because I have the presentation facing the audience, everything that I'm going to share, I've printed for you so that we can keep the TV facing the audience. So if you'll go to your blue packet, you'll be able to read those pieces that I'm speaking to. First and foremost, I would like to say there are some positive trends within our community and positive trends within our schools related to uh, cases in the area. Today, February 22nd, you can see that Wyndham County is at one of its lowest points it's been since August. You'll also notice at the top that the state of Connecticut is again returning to the number of COVID cases, uh, which is prior to what we had seen close to Thanksgiving. For us here in Plainfield, uh, our student attendance on the next page actually saw its best attendance day on Wednesday of last week. That's actually the best attendance that we've seen in Plainfield, Connecticut in the last 18 months. And for students and families in the audience who are looking at those two spikes wondering why there's such great attendance on those days, those are actually snow days. So, <laughs> no one was absent on those days. In other positive sites that we're seeing, uh, I would note that when we take a look at our mitigation strategies, the distribution of testing kits, we're seeing a dramatic reduction in the number of students who are coming into our nurse's office showing symptoms and asking for testing kits. As I reported in our February 9th board meeting, in the month of January and February, February by February 9th, we had distributed 330 kits. If you take a look, that's approximately 75 kits a week we were distributing, looking at those pieces. Since that time, we've only distributed 73 kits. So we've actually cut the number of individuals coming down to the nurse's office requesting kits down in half. <coughs> Since that February 9th presentation to the Board of Ed, there's been updates on legislation related to mass and vaccinations. And I asked the board to turn to the page that says updates on legislation so I can speak to these items. At this time, the Connecticut legislator has voted to extend mandatory school masking through February 28th. As of February 28th, the mask mandate is suspended. Within the powers given to the governor, he retains executive authority to reinstate a mask mandate in the case of an outbreak until June 30th, 2022, at which point those executive powers end. While the mask mandate has been suspended, at this time there is still a federal TSA guideline, which extends until March 18th, which require masking on all public transportation. Per that guideline, that includes school buses. So while the state mandate has ended on the 28th, the federal mandate at this point extends until March 18th. As I noted in our last board meeting, Order 13G, which required the testing of vaccinated employees, ended on Wednesday the 15th and was not extended. Thus, we are no longer requiring employees in the state of Connecticut for state agencies or for public schools to be vaccinated or to have to submit to weekly testing. That ended last week. On Friday the 18th, three important documents came out from the State Department of Education. And I think these documents are very important to the Board of Education. And these are the documents that I sent home and included in your packet.
first of these is a guidance document which assists schools in transitioning to a model for COVID-19 management that aligns with the public health approach and the routine management of respiratory and viral diseases. The second document includes questions to consider when, when uh, contemplating potential changes to COVID-19 policies, including universal masking in schools or transitioning to mask optional policies. As I noted in our last board meeting, should the board choose to vote tonight to move to a mask optional policy, we do have the board policy on masks, and the motion will need to require that that policy be suspended. If you look at the top of the page where I wrote guidance from the State Department of Ed, the Department of Health, and the CIAC, there's a very important line, which is the opening line of the state's guidelines to schools, which I think is important for our discussion today. And this line is, given the widespread availability of COVID-19 vaccines, at-home testing and medications, our communities can begin to transition to updated models of COVID-19 management. I'm going to speak to what those recommendations are in those documents for the board and for the community. First and foremost is the state recommends routine strategies for COVID-19 prevention. Note the words I've highlighted on this document recommending vaccination for those who are eligible, supporting students and staff who choose to continue wearing a mask even when policies do not support their use, following isolation guidelines for those individuals who have symptoms or have tested positive for COVID-19, recommending COVID-19 transmission prevention strategies, and continuing to advise individuals to report all cases of COVID-19 to the school and subsequently to the state of Connecticut, and being prepared to respond quickly to rapid increases of cases or clusters of cases in schools. These are the routine strategies for COVID-19 prevention recommended by the state document for everyday use in schools. Should we see higher cases of COVID-19 in the community, the new state guidance recommends spacing, ventilation, enhanced cleaning, and communication to encourage the heightened awareness by students, staff, and parents. The state document also includes notes for outbreak response. I would note that an outbreak is a very high level of COVID transmission in a school. In December, when we had our very high levels of COVID in our schools, and in fact, January 10th, when we had our highest level of absenteeism, we did not reach outbreak status. At outbreak response strategies, the state guidelines call for limited mixing or cohorting, re-implementing universal mask in response to an outbreak, limitation of outside visitors, and the notification of potentially exposed students and staff, and recommending <coughs> testing for those individuals. I would note that on Friday the 18th, the State Department of Education, and you may have seen the press conference, also noted that before February 28th, School districts can expect to receive additional shipments of self-test to distribute two kits per student and staff member. In schools discontinuing universal masking, it's the state's recommendation that all kits be used as a screening for the community just prior to lifting the universal masking. Now, as individuals may be aware, we received notification from the State Department of Connecticut, of, uh, Connecticut that these kits would not be available until Monday. However, Thanks to Mr. Sugarman and the Town of Plainfield and some of our other partners, we have obtained enough testing kits that we're doing distribution to our staff and community tomorrow so that we have those available for individuals who wish to access them. I've sent a communication home to families today. I would note that those are not being distributed directly to students given the chemicals that are in the kits. Those are things that we would ask families to pick up so that they have the ability to have access to those. So I'd like to thank those individuals who help members who help volunteer to uh, help us distribute those kits tomorrow. <clears throat> Finally, I would like to note that on February 18th, we also received guidance from the CIAC. For those who don't know what the CIAC is, that is the Connecticut Interschool Athletic Conference. And in their guidance, it notes that beginning Monday, February 28th, the CIAC, in consultation with its medical experts, will no longer require masks at any outdoor practices and competitions, and it does not require masks for students, athletes, or officials while participating in indoor competitions and practices. This is a direct change from what we've seen previously from the CIAC, and this document was just released on Friday afternoon. So as you'll note, on February 18th, the state released much of the guidance that they had told us would be released on the 14th, previous uh, board meeting, I spoke to the fact that I wanted to see this guidance before making recommendations. And with that, I'd actually like to hand the microphone over to Mr. Scott Sugarman, 
many individuals know as the Assistant Superintendent of Schools. He's also the individual who has been sending you for the last 18 months all of the COVID liaison updates weekly. Uh, Mr. Sugarman, can you speak to the parent and faculty feedback from the survey and then the mitigation strategies? Absolutely. Thank you for having me oh. here today, board members and community. So first, as Mr. Brenton said at the start, we did have a tremendous response to the survey, both in uh, electronic and paper. We had over 1,200 responses to our survey. As you see, we had roughly 70% of those responses were from parent uh, responses. Okay. This is our distribution. The next slide talks about the distribution by, by age level. Uh, so we did have a good over 100% responses in every age range. Uh, from our pre-K all the way to our high school uh, age range of over 450 responses. Uh, for the community members behind me, sorry I don't have it back to you, um, but just so you know, the blue is the percent of responses that are looking to have masks be optional, and the dark red is to continue to have masks required. Uh, the first question that we ask is, you know, do you want what the mass usage in school 80% of the responses was to have masks be responsible with 20% being masks required. I will say, as Mr. Brenton and I were looking at this as the survey first went out, at 100 responses, 200, 500, it stayed right around that 80, 20 number all the way throughout. Uh, the second question was following that low to moderate transmission within the community. Again, the responses went actually up to 83%, people feeling more comfortable with masks being optional. And then for high transmission, it actually went to a 60-40 split. 60% of the community or responses wanting masks to be optional and 40%. I think it's important to note for the board and for the community, to me and my interpretation of those three questions, was it's pretty clear what the community response is. But it's also, people were very serious and genuine as they filled out the survey. Because as they completed that question about high transmission, right, people changed their, their response, right? They said, in response to something that becomes more significant, we understand that that might be required. To me, that shows a level of respect and responsibility to how people were completing that survey and how they were treating that response. And I just, that's personally from my opinion, but I think that's an important thing to highlight in the responses that we have. And again, the last question was individuals within the building, 70-30 split between optional. We had around 400 comments. You all received those comments in your packet too as well. And then we didn't want to forget the people that completed the paper submission of the survey. Um, so the next slide, I ended, we had about 300 paper responses. Again, it's slightly more in the direction of optional. But if you look at the flow of the three questions, it still follows the same flow. So about 90% 90% about, um, excuse me, there you go. Slightly more than 80% for mass optional in the responses. But when you click through to the low transmission, it goes up slightly above. And when you get to the high transmission question, again, it gets closer to that 60-40 split. So you can see that trend of how people responded staying true throughout the paper and the online survey. Sorry, this is a little thin. So, I wanted to talk about mitigation strategies if I can. And I think we wanted to talk about this because as someone who has, has borne the responsibility for Plainfield over the past 18 months and two superintendents of reporting out about COVID and where we stand, what are we doing, what do the numbers look like, I do want to let the board know, uh, if I may, that I think it's important for us as a district to start to transition to a new phase of how we're dealing with this. I think we feel comfortable as a district to make that transition, that we have the resources in district and the knowledge in district to start to make that transition to what would it look like if masks were optional and what are other mitigation strategies that we have. So I want to emphasize some of those additional mitigation strategies where we're still being responsible and respectful as a district in supporting all the needs, but we're also still being responsible about what we're dealing with, and we're still dealing with something that uh, is a level of seriousness that we need to treat that. 
So first, the first mitigation strategy is us to start to transition to a test and stay option and not a quarantine option of our students. What that means is before, uh, students would have to quarantine for five, seven, 10, even longer depending on the situation. Because we've accumulated enough COVID test kits through partnering with the, the federal government, state, and also us purchasing our own, we feel like we have enough test kits in the district to allow students that are exposed to COVID as a primary contact to continue to come to school as long as they're testing every day. We would provide the test to the families to be able to do that every day and still maintain a safe environment while also allowing our students to no longer miss school, which has been a significant thing to students' disruption and progress within school, but also isolation from their peers. So what we would want to start with is Mr. Brenton talked about beginning tomorrow to a mass distribution to all students and staff in district, allow people to have a, a clean slate of testing on Friday so we, so we know that we're coming back on Monday with, with that knowledge. And then on an ongoing basis, if any of our students are exposed and previously they would have to quarantine, we would not recommend them quarantine anymore. We would recommend them doing tests and stay. Um, so they're still staying in school, but we're still being safe and responsible. I included in the second slide, and this is a lot what I talked about, about the mitigation strategy of test and stay. What does it look like? Who would be eligible for that? Again, any student that normally would have to quarantine would be eligible for that. Parents would have to opt into that program, so they would have to choose to do that. You want that parent right to choose and feel comfortable and understand what that means. But again, the overall objective here is to keep our kids actively in school and keep them, keep them in school and not have the length of, of time that a student would have to do tests and stay still would match what a normal quarantine period would be, but typically we're talking about five days under most circumstances. The next strategy that we want to look at doing is really looking at, like with COVID, as we learned when we started, right, the frenzy of everyone like cleaning and, you know, like clean my groceries as they come in the house, right, to changing and understanding that this is much more of an airborne uh, virus. And so we've made an investment using federal COVID relief money, uh, not using local funds, but using that federal relief money that's allocated to start that process beginning in September to ensure that every classroom in district that's used by students has a, a HEPA 13 grade uh, air filter and purifier in that room. So we did just make a, a recent purchase to make sure that now, right, high school 50 came in today, uh, so that allows us that every now room that students use frequently every day uh, will have a, a Medify air filter purifier in that room that can be used throughout the entirety of the school day. We feel like going in that direction of that test and stay, combination with increase of air purifiers and what we can control in that room, is an important step for us to make as a district to transition to this new phase of COVID management uh, going forward. Um, and to really start to return to that more normal setting for our students and, and community. And last, sorry, it's taking a couple of clicks for it to change over. So again, the last slide for you all, uh, as board members of the community, just gives some information on uh, the air purifier units, uh, the, the unit cost, the filtration that's, that's a part of it. It's a HEPA 13 filter. It's 2,500 square feet, 800 cubic feet of space that it does every uh, 30 minutes. The electricity for this, because I know that's a big issue for us, that we just had our capital improvement, being conscious of electricity usage. But basically, one of these units is basically like adding a computer within a classroom. So that's something that our, our system can manage and, and hold on to. The noise level, it's, it has a maximum of four ranges. This will cause minimal inter interruption to the classroom as there's four fan speed levels. And it's just like a regular fan that I don't really say you can We actually have a couple going right now in this building and it's kind of just soft light noise in the background. And then the last is these are very mobile units. Uh, so they do have wheels. You can move them around to a good space within the classroom and other spaces. So uh, from, from my point of view and what we've been dealing with as a district, I think it's 
important and necessary for us to start to emphasize these mitigation strategies that we can now do as a district and understand and have the resources to do and start to transition to a new form of COVID management um, as what's being talked about. This is back to Mr. Brandon. There's no questions. Are there any questions from the board for Mr. Sugarman related to the survey or to mitigation strategies? Um, well then, thank you Mr. Sugarman. I appreciate the work you put into that and I, I appreciate the work your team put into into processing all of those surveys. I, I know that took some time. Um, for myself as superintendent, looking at the information that we received, I would add that on Friday I had the opportunity to go to every single school and district and speak to schools on the professional development day. We spoke to these topics, I talked to staff, I've talked to many staff, I've talked to many parents for concerns. When we look at moving forward and we look at where we are, I'd like to speak to a couple things. First of all, um, I'm very, I feel very comfortable, anxiously comfortable, about the positive trends that we are seeing right now. We're seeing positive trends in student attendance, we're seeing positive trends as far as what we're seeing from our COVID cases in the community. We are seeing that we have uh, lower transmission rates than we've seen previously. I also think about the state's language, about different phases of where we are in the state's recommendations. And when I make my recommendation, I have to ask myself the question, can we as a district do the things that the state recommends to ensure students are safe? Because student safety is very important to me. So can we, moving forward, be sure that we're ensuring space can we be sure we're ensuring ventilation? Uh, in December, Plainfield started thinking ahead. We made two levels of investments. One of the level of investments was in testing kits. That is actually why we're able to distribute testing kits tomorrow, while some other communities may have to wait until after Monday. The second place that we placed our big bet was on these ventilation systems. The systems that you see in the corner there are actually the same as the ones going into 90% of the classroom. If you walk into our cafeteria or gymnasium, you'll see those anti-air systems which are working in the cafeterias and the gyms to clean that air several times an hour. And regardless of whether or not we have COVID, clean air in schools is good for students and healthy. So that's a positive thing and I think it's a worthwhile investment. Um, I've answered a lot of phone calls this week. I've answered a lot of emails. Uh, I've talked to a lot of individuals who have asked me, uh, Paul, where do you stand on this? I've always stood with the idea that Plainfield schools should follow the Department of Health and the State of Connecticut recommendation. At this time, based on where we are with community spread, the recommendation would be to go with suspending the mask policy. So that would be my official recommendation as superintendent moving forward. However, that is a board decision. I would also ask you to make that recommendation in conjunction with the other guidelines from the State of Connecticut, which do allow us to respond in different ways based on different levels of And with that, I'd like to give the board the opportunity to ask any questions before we move to the next session of the meeting. Of some sort, if they want to wear masks. So I would only support 
I'll second.
consider what is put on these masks and our fabric and our clothes um, at the time that they are manufactured. There are flame retardants on most clothing and our beds and our couches to prevent, obviously, a fire in our house, but there are hazardous to our health. So if you would consider, in a future reference, before masking up people and thinking that it's safe, to consider what is on these things. And there's a reason why, on your fabric, why it says wash before wear, because it's hazardous to your health. That's all I have to say. Thank you. She wants to know if the dividers can come down when they're sitting at the table or if they're just the mask. Hello, Molly. Um, within the strategies, the strategies outline what happens based on COVID spread. Under low, low COVID spread, the dividers may come down. We have to realize that if there was an outbreak, some things may have to come back.
I think in a, in a good way. Um, I appreciate that you are taking the mats off our kids. Um, I had this nice long speech um, planned out because um, I work at Thompson in Thompson Public Schools and we went mass optional um, as well. So I'm glad that you can follow suit. Um, taking other strategies 
but I hope you understand how serious this is and how, to have, how much it has affected all of us and especially our children.
that speaks really well for our, our community. Um, one piece that I would just note and ask to the community, you will see a communication coming out tonight or early this morning talking about test kit distribution. Uh, that is something that we're going to strongly encourage that uh, every family come to pick up test kits so that we have the ability to do a clean community testing uh, prior to moving to mask optional on Monday the 20th. Uh, so if you're here tonight, uh, please come back tomorrow to pick up those test kits from Plainfield Schools so that we have those and can be safe. Uh, we have a strong supply here. Thank you to the town of Plainfield and the efforts of Mr. Sugarman. So very much would like to encourage everyone to come back.